Welcome to everybody to this talk by Dr. Arkadev Datta, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Sports Science and Yoga in, in our university. During this COVID-19 pandemic, everybody is talking about lack of concentration, restlessness of mind, uh, unable to focus on work and so on. This is now called concentration deficit. Is there any probable neural mechanism which is responsible for the concentration deficit? Or is it only psychological or both? The mind has a definite effect in the body and vice versa. And the neurons and the neural system is largely responsible for what the mind does in terms of focus, concentration, including the higher levels of concentration called meditation and so on. So today we'll have a really interesting talk from the scientific perspective of a probable neural mechanism of concentration deficit, Dr. Arkadev Datta. Pranam Maharaj. <clears throat> Good evening to my audience. So as we all know, so the theme of the webinar is about meeting the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic, the yogic way. So we know that in most of the cases, even after the patients are recovering from COVID-19, there are the post-COVID complications. Mainly, they are either reporting about their less sleep, sleep disturb disturbances, or anxiety-related disorders. As we know that the disturbance in the smell and the uh, uh, taste is always there, even after the COVID is over. Patients can also having this problem for more than longing for more than a month. So uh, there is definitely a toll on the cognitive health. So this toll means that people, they are facing lack of, as Maharaj has said, that lack of concentration, lack of attention. So today my talk will be about the probable mechanism of this concentration deficit. So as we know that focused attention or the attentional mechanism, it is actually one of the foundation stone of our neural development or the plasticity of our uh, development. So let's begin this talk. So are you all getting my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So <clears throat> my talk will actually cover it will be a very brief one, and I will try to make it uh, uh, very interesting in a way that I will cover the topic on attention and attentional types first, which is very important to learn. Then what is concentration? Because we use both these terms, that is attention and concentration in the same way, but it is a bit different from each other. And then we will speak about the, discuss about the neural correlates of attentional features and its deficits and uh, possible strategies for improve, improving the concentration in a, from the yogic perspective. So what is actually attention? William James, who was a famous American uh, philosopher and psychologist, as well as a historian, he once said that attention is actually processing one out of what seemed several simultaneously possible objects or train of thought. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. So what does it mean? It means, suppose if we take our visual perception every day, our eyes are being bombarded with so many sensory information, visual information, but at a time we can take one. So our brain has a limited resource allocation for attending multiple information at the same moment. Rather, I can say that the most relevant stimulus is taken into consideration. 
for example, if we see uh, this experiment, so this is experiment is called a multi-object tracking task. So you can see on the left of the computer screen that these are the targets which are highlighted with the red uh, designated the subject to the subject that look, these are the three targets. You have to focus on these three targets and these are the steel targets. It will remain still for two seconds. And after that, this target along with these distractors, which are all same in size, shape, and you can see the color also, it will move randomly. And after a certain duration of time, the subject has to say that, okay, now spot the target here, what was first presented. So then the target subject has to validate after when, uh, selecting what he th thinks about the target, the validation will be done. So we can see here why I'm showing here this multiple object task is because our brain is very limited in taking the, I mean, for the resource allocation that if we increase the target number, if you see here the bar diagram, we see here that the number of participants who were successful in spotting more than 50% of the targets. So when the targets were just three, then we can see the number of participants were most successful in getting 50% of the times uh, spotting the targets. And uh, here, when the target number was four, then we can see that there is a limitation that less number of subjects that they were able to get succeeded in the tasks. So that means that as we in increase the difficulty of the task in the sense we increase more and more sensory information to process at the same moment of time, there is a limit of taking that information into the brain. So that means that in attention, we can only feature on the relevant information. Now come into the perspective of that what makes a particular informing incoming information relevant or important to us. So there are two ways or the two phenomena. One is the stimulation, stimulus driven phenomena. Another we call it the goal directed task. So in the stimulus driven phenomena, we say it's the saliency or the unexpectedness of a stimulus uh, in comparison to the background. So here you can see the star is a salient in comparison to these identical circles. So definitely this star will catch our attention. Similarly, if we see that these are all these small circles, the bigger one, the circle with greater intensity, physical intensity, it will draw our attention. So these attention sometimes are stimulus driven and sometimes they are goal directed. Goal directed in a sense is that, that we use our attention in everyday life in a goal directed way when we are driving, whether we are learning, whether we are writing, or whether we are doing any kind of motor ex or execution, ex execution tasks. So a goal-directed task means that you have a prior knowledge and advanced knowledge of the stimulus. Like if I say that, okay, you spot a person in a seminar hall who is wearing a red hat. So what will you do? Because the target here is given to you because this is pre-advanced and pre-expected thing that you have to spot the person, anyone who is in the seminar room and listening to the seminar with a small red hat on his hat, uh, head. So this is called the goal-directed task or a goal-directed task even if you are going into uh, the Tiger Hill to watch the sunrise, the, the snow-clad peaks of Kanchenjunga. So you have a goal, you have to look on that particular place, the location, in order to see the sunrise. So now <laughs> this stimulus driven and goes in our way. So I will speak a little bit of this network first, but before going to that, I have to a little bit elaborate about Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm sorry, there is a connection instability, it was going. <clears throat> so what do you mean by the exogenous attention or bottom up? So we can further define the stimulus driven as attention, as well as the top down of the goal directed attention into 
two times. So exogenous attention means which is outwardly, which is actually governed by the physical intensity of the stimulus, the unexpectedness of the stimulus, the, the very intense voluminous as well as suddenness of the stimulus. So that's why it's called exogenous attention or we can say the stimulus oriented attention. There is another name, we call it bottom up attention. Why bottom, bottom up? Because it is coming directly from the sensory organs in case of our, suppose if we take visual attention or visual perception, it comes through the sense of organ of our eyes and then it goes to the higher center of our brain. And what about the endogenous attention? That is the goal-directed attention. When you have a goal, set of goal in your mind, given a task, and you have to do that task. So in that case, these kind of attentions are governed by the higher centers of our brain. That is the frontal lobe, the prefrontal lobe. Now, <clears throat> what is concentration? So we have discussed about attention. Attention can be a selective attention, like the goal-driven, or the attention can be a divided attention when I allocate so many numbers of stimuli and then I say that, okay, you have to attend all of them at the same time, like the divided attention I have shown you. And there is another feature or more definitive kind, which is called the concentration. The concentration is the total immersion of your attentional features, that is your focus at the present moment of time. You did not have to think about the past. You did not have to think what will be the future outcome, but you have to all shut down all the exogenous distractions and just to be mindful about that particular event on which you are concentrating or which you are focusing. So actually maintaining the concentration has two strategies. So it's a kind of focused attention. So you can focus exogenously, you can focus on your internal thoughts also. So maintaining concentration has generally two strategies. So one is increasing attention to the relevant information that you are watching as well as or thinking, as well as at the same time, decreasing the attention to relevant information. Now, if we look before going to the pathways, just, uh, uh, just see the brain and think about its working or functional perspective in a very simple manner. So we can see this is the front part of our brain. We call it the frontal lobe and divided by the central sulcus behind is the parietal lobe and this is lateral sulcus and beneath is the temporal lobe and here is the occipital lobe. Usually the cerebral cortex, if we see it is uh, divided into four lobes. So basically they have these three lobes I will speak about because we know the occipital lobe has a function in processing visual information definitely, but parietal lobe, it is functioning for integration, perception of all the different sensory senses, like whether it's a touch, whether it's a sound, whether it's a vision, and then it also integrates all together. Fine. Then what is the function of the frontal lobe? The frontal lobe, which occupies the major part of our brain is actually have many functions like our motto execution, like different cognitive functions in working memory, in thought processes, in judgment, in uh, while speaking, in language. So this is an enormous role that our frontal lobe actually executes. And the temporal lobe is also important for processing the ventral aspects of our perceptual information, plus in the middle part of the, which, which is not seen here in the temporal lobe, there is an, there is an area uh, which processes our emotion and feelings, quite fair. So if we think of the brain in its function, we know that the parietal lobe, it functions as the, it's actually a perceptual hub. It receives all the sensory uh, information, it perceives it, and thus it makes a sense of it, it integrates one sensory information or modality with another. And this frontal lobe, it is actually very important in our thoughts, in our judgment, in our movement, in our planning, in our language, and the temporal is also a part of the ventral processing stream of our perception, plus it has other features like memory processing, episodic memory, and processing the emotion and the feelings. So now, <clears throat> If we go back to this attentional network again, where I say that there are two different kinds of attention, goal-directed and exogenous, 
So we will see now that where these pathways are actually situated. First, we see the goal-directed attention. So in neuroscience or in cognitive neuroscience, I will say, how we do this kind of work. So actually, you can see here the subject is sitting in front of a computer, and this is the arrow which actually is working as a cue. What kind of cue? The arrow is shown just, for example, two seconds before the stimulus arrives. The stimulus suppose is this box. So what does this arrow signify? The arrow is the cue that you have to attend in this location before the stimulus arrives. So that means it gives an advanced preparedness or to get your mind, the attentive features there get ready that the stimulus will arrive in next two seconds. So what will happen? So these experiments were done on either of the visual field, on the left and the right. And we can see here that these brain areas are lit up. So what are these brain areas? So this is actually an ephemeral, uh, it shows an ephemeral image here of the brain, which shows the organizations that lit up areas actually show that these are the areas which are activated just before the arriving of the stimulus. That when the subject has been given a cue of the stimulus presentation, just two seconds before. That means there is a goal. You have to attend now. So when you are going to attend some thing or some objects, some things, you will see that these areas are already lit up. Now you know this area is in the frontal area and these areas are in the parietal area. So if he, if is the human homolog of uh, frontal eye field, and these are the, in, these are the uh, anterior intraparietal areas and the posterior parietal areas. And this vast area you can see, this vast area is something related to the visual perception. Visual perception means the subject is thinking of some visual object. And whenever he thinks, even the object is not there, these areas get lit up. So anyway, these are the transient kind of activation, but what stays is actually in these three areas. So now the next question is <clears throat> whether this attention we are speaking about, whether this is actually a directional cue. It is just subserving the areas that whether the subject is gave, getting aware of the location of the information. Because here, if you see these both curves, the both curves are actually the signal intensities. And you can see the signal intensities is actually rising whenever the cue is presented here. So, and the signal intensity is actually when the cue is showing rightward or even leftward in both cases, which is saying that it's attending left or right are the same. So the next thing is no, <clears throat> they have to prove that this cue is actually not only the location attribute that the stimulus will arrive here. It is something also regarding the context of the stimulus. So what happens next is if you change that okay, you attend now to the direction of the motion. Direction of the motion means now next there will be many circles which will be projected and these circles will move from, uh, suppose, in the rightward direction of the subject. So that means there is no particular spatial information about that or the location one has to attend. They say that there will be multiple of circles and it will move towards right orientation. So that also shows that the expectedness of the stimulus actually lit up or activates these areas. So what are these areas called? So we can name now that this is called the dorsal frontoparietal network. Why dorsal? Because if this is the brain, we say this part of the brain as the dorsal part, and this part of the brain we call as the ventral part of the brain. So dorsal parietal network, frontoparietal network means this is actually the frontal part of the frontal lobe of the brain, and this is the parietal lobe of the brain. So that means the name emerges from the, actually the topography of the brain. So now the next thing is, so the goal-directed attention, you can see that there are many scholars who has done different studies, uh, fMRI studies, and these are the organization of this area. And pretty much you can see from this right hemisphere, then when the subjects are attending only, that is expecting a stimulus to arrive in a particular area or particular type of every area, right? These areas usually get activated or lit up. And when the stimulus is actually presented, then we can see 
that the leading up or the activation is becoming much more in intensity. That means these areas have both a goal-directed attentional uh, correlate as well as the stimulus attributes often uh, are also being represented here. So what does this dorsal parietal frontal network, dorsal frontal parietal network does? So it creates an advanced awareness to stimulus selection. It also works during a walking memory task. What will be done walking memory task? Suppose you have, we have said someone or given someone, okay, we recite a number. And after some time, we tell that subject, now tell the number or the telephone number I just have told you. So this is actually the working memory. So working memory also needs this network to function, the dorsal frontal parietal network. In task switching, task switching means when we are changing a task successively to a subject. Suppose when we are saying the subject, you pronounce a vowel, or we are giving the next time in the trial some tasks related to consonants, or we are playing with odd even numbers in the uh, children, then we can see that during this task switching, these dorsal frontal parietal networks are also activated. And this is also important for the preparedness of our effector responses. Because when I'm speaking about goal-directed attention, goal-directed attention means that whatever the perceptual information we get, we sometimes have to turn into some executive function or some kind of uh, motor-driven functions. Like we have to activate either of our saccadic eye movements. We have to go for a reach function after spotting something, or we can go for a grasp function that is grasping the object or the thing. So this preparedness of the effector responses are also being conducted from this dorsal frontoparietal network. So what happens to this dorsal frontoparietal network? What happens that when we are focusing on some of our goals related work, right? We are writing something, we're learning something. And certainly some person from the outside, he knocks the door of the cabin. So this is called stimulus salience. So what we will most often do, we will look at the door, who is there? So that means, that what we are doing at that particular moment of time can be broken by some stimulus salients, whether the knocking of the door or some familiar voice who is calling. So this dorsal frontal parietal network can be modulated by the stimulus salients because this is very important. I am saying that most of the times we find uh, the children or persons who are uh, suffering from attention defic deficit most often they even respond to behaviorally non-relevant stimulus while they are into some goal or objective doing uh, uh, some object related or goal related doing some goal related tasks. So anyway, <clears throat> so now we come to know that the stimulus salience has something to do with this uh, frontal paradoxal frontal parietal network. So this can also be checked by the search or detection of the motion target. So Suppose if these are the circles and the circles are all moving randomly over the screen. Now out of 100, suppose if 10% of the dots, they move in a coherent direction. And in another case, suppose in that 100%, 50% of the dots move in a coherent direction and the remaining in the other different direction, random direction, you will see that the 50% coherency will catch our attention. So that's called the salience. So sometimes when the physical importance or the intensity of this, uh, this, this kind of uh, stimulus, that is attention taking stimulus comes suddenly when we are executing a goal related task, it breaks that salience. Now, if we see that how does this work? Where is that place of the salience? So stimulus salience, when we study, we can see that this is our, actually a nature. When we look at some information, some relevant information, I'm speaking about the visual uh, here, perception. After the relevant information has been uh, processed, we start looking on the re relevant features there in the visuals, definitely. So now you see the relevant features are called the valid target, 
and the irrelevant features we call the invalid target. So there is already an inbuilt network circuitry that makes our uh, kind of a little deviation from what we are doing to what we should not do. Like we also give our attention to less important things at some times. So this is also the thing that we can see that the frontal marital circuits are modulated. So now, <clears throat> what does this stimulus salience mean? So we know right now that there is a dorsal frontoparietal network, which is responsible for goal-directed uh, task or attention that we have a task in hand and we're attending to that, whether we are attending a class or a seminar. And certainly there is another uh, attentional network, which is called the stimulus-driven. Stimulus-driven means that suddenness or the as I say, that very intenseness, intenseness of sudden sensory stimulus, which can break the circuit of what we are doing. And this is actually called the right ventral, ventral frontoparietal network. So why I'm saying it's right? Because this is actually have a very lateralized uh, location that it is only found in the right hemisphere. So any of these regions, which we can see that colored regions, if they are damaged in the right hemisphere, that can make the sensory neglect and related this kind of uh, uh, orienting attention. That is, saliency driven orientation will be hampered in subjects if these areas are actually damaged in the right hemisphere, but not in the left hemisphere, because this circuit or this network is not present in the left hemisphere. But in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, both the goal directed networks are present. So here, these are the <coughs> uh, past work. And you can see these are the areas. So these areas are quite different in a sense. If we can study, we have seen initially that the frontal eye field, that is this dorsal part of this uh, network or the brain areas was activated during goal directed attention. And now there is a shift in distribution that here we can see for the saliency driven attention, the ventral part of our brain is getting more activated, as well as there is another important place we call is the temporal uh, parietal junction. So this temporal parietal junction and these ventral or we can say that uh, inferior frontal gyrus, this area, these are the areas which drives our sensory uh, orientation. And in cases, sometimes it breaks the goal-oriented attention that we are doing. So let's see how this, if, we, if I project into the brain in a schematic way, so you can see that these light blue colored nodules are actually the frontoparietal, dorsal, uh, uh, dorsal frontoparietal network. And here, uh, the orange colored nodules, we can say this is actually the ventral frontoparietal network. So this network is actually, we can say, say it's, it's a kind of frontoparietal network. And this frontoparietal network, which occupies some region of our frontal areas of the brain, that is of both the dorsal as well as the ventral part into the parietal areas of the brain and into the temporal junctions, they make the circuits or the network of both kind of attention. That is the goal directed and the stimulus directed attention. So sometimes how these attentional features are gets modulated. I say that there are other brain areas because these are the network features. It takes place at the early, very early stage of our development, we know. So it's during this development, child development. So these networks are very important for, for actually conducting the basic functions of the attentional networks. But besides this, there are other networks in the brain which modulate this network. One such is the midbrain area. So in the midbrain area, which is actually deep inside the brain, I'm just showing it here over the peripheral surface, but actually it's inside the brain in the deep inside. If you cut the midline, across the midline, you will see this midbrain area and there is a, place called the locus cerulus of the brainstem area and the basal forebrain tegmental cortex. So here, actually, some of our basic awareness are being governed through these areas. That when we go to sleep, when we are awake, 
when we are agitated, when we are too much anxious. So these are the areas which actually releases the neurotransmitters called the, uh, uh, the uh, noradrenaline or norepinephrine. And here from the basal forebrain or tegmental complex, you will see that these are the acetylcholine. So basically the cholinergic uh, pathways which have their projections over this frontoparietal network, it actually regulates our co-directed behavior. And what about the locus cerulius? Locus cerulius, which have their noradrenergic projections, they actually regulate our ventral frontoparietal network that is the stimulus-driven attention. So stimulus-driven attention means the suddenness, intenseness of the stimulus, which breaks our goal-directed network is being regulated by this noradrenergic pathway. So actually attention is something which requires uh, a state where our brainstem uh, nuclei should remain active in a state that not too much active or not too much inactive, that one goes into sleep or too much active means in a state of agitation, in a state of irritation, in a state of anxiety. So in between that, these two things will function and modulate <coughs> our attentional network in a proper way. Now, I come to the next slide is that, <coughs> so what does this network, why? Why I, I am speaking about this network? So this is actually very important for executing our cognitive functions, whether it's of working memory, our thought, or even any kind of decision making, cognitive different kinds of tasks. So this makes this frontoparietal circuit, which actually combines both the dorsal frontoparietal network as well as the parental frontoparietal network, it makes a brain executive network. We can also call it a cognitive control network. So any deficiency or there is a dysfunction or the dysregulation of this network at the various points, it can pr produce our attention deficit. So one such thing which happens in the children who we know that it is called the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is actually uh, uh, have symptoms like lack of attention, lack of concentration, difficulty in task completion. Sometimes they are very hyperactive. They do not concentrate. And they're able to concentrate on a particular work they are doing. They have poor working memory. They have poor decision making and poor emotional regulation. So we see that actually with these attentional frontoparietal network, there are two other regions in the brain. We call it a little bit uh, anterior to this frontal eye field, human homologue of frontal eye field. We call it dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And another important area called the anterior cingulate cortex. So these anterior cingulate cortex is actually, if you cut the brain from the midline, you see here this white matter this is the corpus callosum, and just over the corpus callosum, you will find this area called the anterior cingulate cortex. So these anterior cingulate cortex and dorsolateral lateral prefrontal cortex, they show the functional, I mean, uh, abnormality in the attention deficient disorders. Now, researchers are trying to find out that we know that there are some kind of uh, dopaminergic dysregulation, like in the neurotransmitters, which uh, do take place and is responsible for this kind of uh, this kind of lack of attention or lack of concentration in these subjects. Besides, there are also the noradrenergic modulation, as I have uh, just spoken about, which results may result to hyperactivity also. So, this brain executive network. So, I say that when we complain about that, we cannot concentrate when we are doing something. We cannot sustain our attention for a long time. Our attention gets broken and we just start, so we can see our mind wandering somewhere else. So, and sometimes our, what, what we are doing when we are executing some task, we are just clouded with some kind of negative thoughts, negative emotions. Why is it happening? Do something so that we can, uh, we can concentrate, we can attend to what we are doing. So now I have talked about this, I've just said, about this anterior cingulate cortex area. So I will speak something a little bit about this anterior cingulate cortex because now the current research is more focusing on this area, why? Because anterior cingulate cortex is something which is very important for our cognitive as well as the emotional behavior. 
Because here I have not shown you the emotional circuitry, that is the emotional network, uh, which includes the amygdala, our hippocampus, and then the parahippocampal complex, which we call as an extended papillary circuit. But this anterior cingulate cortex, it actually, on one hand, it holds the cognitive control network, and on the other hand, it holds the limbic network which governs our feelings and emotion. And this is very important. It is also a center which also judges our action. Judges our action means when we are doing errors, it judges our action. Oh, you have done that error. And if a person is too, is too much bothered, bothered about his uh, action, which are related to error, then that produces the negative emotion. And this negative emotion can affect this anterior cingulate cortex, and by the way, it can also uh, disturb the actual functioning during a goal directed attentional task or whatever in a concentration when we are doing. Besides, this anterior cingulate cortex it's also regulates itself like when we are doing some tasks in difficulty, so it does error monitoring. It is also activated during some kind of uncertain situations like in COVID-19 situation, it is very uncertain. We don't know what is going on. If we look at this function of the anterior cortex, cingulate cortex, we can see maybe there will be some kind of changes which is coming in the next few years. We don't know. And then if we uh, see that this anterior cingulate cortex also takes part in the correct judgment like upon motor activities. Motor activities means, suppose you are driving a car and suddenly you find a green signal there. And suddenly you start your accelerator and the clutch in order to move the car on. And suddenly you find in the great zebra crossing, someone who is not to be expected there at that moment of time, just is passing through the uh, uh, pedestrian. So what will do? Whether you will take your car? No. So that kind of present judgment is also regulated by this anterior cingulate problem settings. Now there is a work here <clears throat> which shows uh, that, uh, anyway, I will come into that later on. But if we see here, so how do we actually find these neural correlates of our attention, concentration, and this kind of all of these uh, the related cognitive tasks in these areas? There are ways, definitely. So we have different kind of psychological, psychophysical tests of selective attention, like dichotic listening tasks. We actually put the children in this case, the young children and there are two uh, sound boxes on the left and right side and we say okay you have to now concentrate the story which will be presented from the left sound box actually both the stories will be running at the same time then we will see that how we comprehend the story from the left speaker or the right speaker or something taken from the both one so these shows the attentional feature that how at the young age uh, they are actually selectively attending to students then one important feature is the inhibitory control. How efficient are we in controlling our actions? Like we know that our actions are actually composed of both excitatory as well as inhibitory circuit. So there are tasks which call the go as well as no go tasks. The go no go task means you will not going to press a button for a reaction and for go task you have to make it. So we also try to find it out whether uh, through this kind of inhibitory control task, which is a stroop test, is a kind of uh, color coding test in the lead letter, that how a subject is able and how long he's able to put his goal directed attention into that particular task. Then there are working memory tasks like forward and backward digit span tasks. We increase the number of digits each time, and you say forward spanning as well as backward spanning. You say the subject, okay, now you try to match the sample that I have just spoken about. Then there are attentional shifts also, I say that go-no-go -go and divided attention. So how we actually measure these different kind of attentional features or cognitive features, which are related to attention. One such is called the event-related potentials. So event-related potential is just big place, the small electrodes over the skull by different places. Now you know the places like the frontal area of the brain, prefrontal area, parietal areas, temporal areas. And we try to uh, record uh, the specific events of those particular tasks 
of selective attention, inhibitory control, working memory, attention and device, that we know that any kind of these behavior, these behaviors are actually time locked with the small changes in the voltages. And this voltage evoked from any areas. So these waves, these waves you can see, they are so much conserved. Conserved in the sense means there are positive waves as well as negative waves, and these waves are time locked, and each time locked wave has its own meaning. Some wave, which is a negative wave, in one which takes place between 90 to 100 milliseconds, 200 between 200 milliseconds, is actually responsible for saliency driven attention. So, if that amplitude of the wave in a particular area, the perceptual area of the brain is increased, that means your attention is saliency driven. So there are other waves which shows that how better a person is in controlling his inhibition. So we study this kind of waves to event related potential. So this is one of the wave. So this has been recorded from a prefrontal lobe from the multi-unit, uh, multi-object tracking task. Here you can see that the targets in the subjects who actually were able to make 100% correct, right? for all the four targets which are embedded and actually moving with the destructors, they show a different pattern, right? Than when those subjects which were done uh, their work, that is their target they estimated less than 100%. So you can see from this that there is a definite differences that can be projected from these small or minute voltage changes in the brain. And these are not a, from a single subject. These are something like, in this case, 350 or 400 trials. So the blue uh, actually line means that this is the average of 350 trials from those subjects who made 100 out of 100 current in determining the four targets after moving in the multi-object task. And this black or the, this red means that those are the, 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 the wave which actually uh, in the subjects who made less than 100% correct in target uh, detection. So this is how we make event-related potential as a very important instrument in order to find uh, the different kind of attentional features, attentional deficits from different kinds of circuits. There is another way we can do here. This is someone's work, Bunda Zetel, I am showing you by EEG. So how these psychophysical tests work, you can see here that this is a blank screen. So one is looking at the queue, and then the subject has been said that, okay, you covertly attend to this situation. So covertly means, what do you mean by covertly? Covertly means whenever the arrow will be shown, don't make eye movement here. Just put your fixation here. The eye should be fixed here. Just overtly you try to concentrate or focus on this dot. And then you can see that here, three different stimulus, that is the gratings or uh, they arrive, the GABA, GABA uh, uh, spots. And one of the GABA spots, they increase their contrast. And certainly when you detect the increase in the contrast, you press a button, that is your execution. So EEG here, you can see these colored waves actually. These are actually the spectral density maps. What does this broken line signify? The broken line actually signifies that time when the cube was presented, this arrow. Here, when the stimulus was presented, means when the stimulus appeared, this broken line. And when the contrast change is happening and the button press is here. So from here, you can see this X axis is actually the response or whatever the brain waves that are going on. And the Y axis is actually the different Oscillation in the brain. The different oscillation in the brain means the lower oscillation we know starts from the delta, moves towards alpha, theta, alpha, beta, and goes to a higher range. That is the gamma. So we try to find out from these four rows that four rows are actually the four different areas of the brain. So how the information processing of a particular attentional task is going on. So this is how we relate with a person who is having is, is actually having a normal attentional features and some person which is at that present moment of time may be disturbed by some emotional uh, mal health or other features and cannot concentrate on the job. So these are the ways we actually technically use in studying these attentional features. Now, <clears throat> so we know about the prefrontal, <coughs> sorry, prefrontal, 
network. There is another network in the brain. There are several others actually. One important is the default mode network. This is important to know because as I say, sometimes our attentions are disturbed by the state of our mind. When our mind is disturbed or we are in a, not in a very good emotional health. So this happens. So there is, uh, there is a recent uh, work also, which says that but the low remnants and one between low remnants and high remnants. High remnants means who is thinking for too long, who is very thoughtful, and they are uh, thinking mostly of the neg negative emotions. Uh, they are saying that uh, the paper that they are more prone to what? So they are more prone to like uh, not able to do their executive function or the cognitive or put their attentional network or the cognitive control network in a proper way when they are executing the task. So they have been given two different kind of tasks. One, when they say that okay, you have to concentrate upon your breath. That the task is related to the mindfulness of on your breath. And us and a different set of these high remnants. They are said that you need not have to concentrate on the breath. You have to concentrate just on your current emotional state that you are experiencing. So what was found is that, that it is very easy to control the cognitive control network or the executive control network when the task is related to focus on the breath. But when the subjects are said, now you have to focus on your emotional health then there are times when the subjects, I mean, their subjective experience says that are clouded with their negative emotions. At that time, they have shown that they show that uh, these high incidence or the activations of these anterior uh, cingulate cortex areas and the activations of this uh, uh, cognitive control network of the executive network is increased. That means they have to give or put more attention on true in a sense that if you are too much thoughtful about your negative emotions, then you have to put more attention to what you are doing. So <clears throat> there is another network is called the default mode network. So what does this default mode network does? Default mode network has nothing to do with net the attention, the attention in the sense, the exogenous attention or the mold related attention we are saying, but it is important. It is important in regulating our negative emotions, like it is actually operative when we are in a resting state. It is an awareness, an awareness of a cell, which we can call it as minimal cell. Minimal cell means a cell who is not participating in any kind of executive work with the external environment, but, but rather watching from uh, somewhere that uh, with the mind wandering that what I have done, what is going in our thoughts and these that, that the things. So. Actually, why I'm telling this, why I'm coming out on this uh, cognitive control network? Because nowadays, rather than uh, going on different kind of drug therapies or the cognitive behavioral therapies, one important context which is happening is actually treating ourselves or benefiting ourselves by doing the yoga. Yoga in a sense means if we go and think of the eight limbs of Patanjali Yoga Sutras, so as we said that, and I have also learned from this previous, uh, all these lectures, a lot of things, and tried to relate in my own way that how we can do think of these things, like how we can make our attention and our cognitive health much more better. It's not like not only to uh, mend the cognitive or uh, executive network, but the, by the side, we can also think of the help of our this uh, default mode network because this default mode network, which has one important brain area, which is called the posterior cingulate area. So one is the anterior cingulate area, another is the posterior cingulate area. So anterior cingulate area is known as it makes our error monitoring. It actually participates when we are actually actively participating or doing our task with the environment. And this is the area that is the resting, the default mode network, when actually we are not participating in any work, but we are aware, aware of the things going around. We are just wondering our mind and just, just, just thinking of this scenario. So if we can bring together, if we can make a better health, a mental health, our, we can increase our 
uh, the positive emotion or the positive the inner thoughts with the help of this network. At the same time, we, we can, through our positive goal directional uh, uh, tasks, right? Doing the goal directional tasks, we can improve ourselves. That means a holistic improvement. And in holistic improvement, if we look at these eight limbs, we start with the external disciplines like yamas, niyamas, which means that you have to practice something like honesty, positive uh, attributes of your personality of, of our work in order to develop positive emotions, in order to develop positive virtues. That means we actually develop our uh, emotional centers and put a less load on the SEC, right? Which actually judge most of the time our errors with our emotion because it is a common connecting hub. Then if we can increase our body awareness, our mind awareness or the awareness of our uh, like proprioceptive awareness through yoga, through pranayama, that means these are actually the goal directed tasks, isn't it? These are the goal directed tasks when we are doing Surya Namaskar, when we are doing, or we are maintaining different kind of asanas or postures, when we are uh, uh, performing pranayamas like inspiration, breath holding and expiration at a particular period of time, is it not that we are imposing our control on the brainstem areas, but as well as we are increasing the awareness of our external body as well as our internal organs. And then definitely with all these things, we are actually, increasing and sometimes willfully, willfully we can detach from our senses. It can be done. And the concentrations means you can concentrate when you exogenously as well you can concentrate by concentrating on your breath or into deeper thoughts. And then I will not go into these two parts because these are right now, I cannot say, but what we can say is that we can improve with these following six lanes, and there are actually evidences, that's why I'm saying that at this present moment of time, because we cannot see what's lie on the other side of the mountain. These are here. We can change ourselves with these six practices right now as a general being, as a general human being I'm speaking about. So how, because there is a paper here, you can, uh, if you are interested, you can read. So focused attention meditation changes the boundary and configuration of functional networks in the brain. I'm speaking about the plastics. So nothing is hardwired in the brain. So don't get like saddened or nothing is happening or we have something, them deficits we cannot recover, we can. Because it's in our hand, we have to think of proper practice. And these practices are being scientifically evaluated that yes, there is a reconfiguration of the circuit, of the circuit means the dorsal uh, default mode network as well as the cognitive control network, both the ACC and the PCC, which is actually happening. And this actually takes some time. And these are different kind of mathematical theoretical analysis of the brain which are happening. And uh, if you were interested, you can read this paper actually, it's a deep top paper. And uh, so if I see, that how these things work. So if I put both these things together, so we can see that this default mode network and the cognitive control network, they are working together. So we can actually make changes, make alterations, make reshufflings and the reconfigurations in these networks through the practices that the Ashtanga Yoga has already uh, postulated and through these practices, when you are doing pranayama, when you are actually controlling your uh, emotion, we are actually controlling your awareness through your breathing, through the asanas, as well as through your more directed mind behavior, you are definitely doing a positive change to your personality and behavior. So this is a very short talk. And with that, uh, I, I actually end here. What is the time now? So it is open for discussion. Oh, no, it's not short. It's actually one hour. <laughs> Please.
Which one? So you have uh, Arka? Yeah, Maharaj. Dr. Arkadev Datta has made everybody speechless. So nobody has any questions to ask. <laughs> so you are talking about the multi object tracking, targeting, validation, and so on. So how do you actually know what's happening inside the brain? <laughs> So you say, when this happens, this man is targeting, when this happens, this man is validating. Is it a kind of back calculation that you do? Or no, you there is no, and these are all the time lock signals. Is so it what from, uh, like questioning the object, the subjects and asking them what they were doing at that time? Or, so I can't, yeah. see, you say the targeting, validation and so on, uh, something is happening, but how do you know that these things are happening? I tell you, because I haven't shown you, uh, shown here also that what I have done uh, in that case, let me see whether uh, I very can show beginning. you that. The very beginning in that slide. Yeah, 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 the particular. Actually, mm, Maharaj, I will share you another slide here. And uh, one more question, also you can yeah. think about this. <clears throat> when you, you always talk about the concentration of an object outside, so in dhyana, the usual practice, you meditate on the Ishta Devata in your heart. So it is concentrating upon an object which is imagined. So you are talk completely on concentrating on the outside objects. Stimulus coming from outside and so on. So what about the stimulus coming from memory? Stimulus coming from some old impression. You're meditating or you're deeply concentrating, suddenly something which somebody said years ago, it comes and impinges upon your system. So this also a stimulus which comes from memory, the store of memory, suddenly it wakes up and then it uh, hits you. So the, the inner thing is completely your uh, uh, concentration that you have not touched upon at all. Yeah, that's why these practices are very important. That's why I have spoken about the default mode network because it is not a very easy practice that to restrict the thoughts from coming. So that's why the total mindfulness or any other techniques, we have to look a lot about these two areas, the anterior cingulate cortex and prefrontal uh, and the posterior cingulate areas and think of the strategies, the how these things are working in that case. Because yeah, this happens. Suddenly, out of nowhere, certain thoughts can emerge. So how should we think about, uh, I mean, how we'll uh, actually manage our internal thoughts? Because it is easy to manage exogenous, uh, thought, uh, exogenous attention, but internal thoughts are something that we have to do, true Maharaj. And uh, yeah, uh, if you give me permission, I can show you the uh, one slide that how I did it about that. Yeah. That. Please. yeah. So, okay, so and this is one of the project which right now I was doing. So with this, so it's something the effect of yogic posture, isometric training on multi-object tracking performance. So this is also a kind of concentration of the balancing act so anyway, I'm not uh, going into the details here. So this is how <clears throat> uh, the paradigm is designed. So how the paradigm is designed is, okay. So uh, the subjects sit in front of the uh, computer and they're shown that, okay, these are the four targets out of this total set size eight, there will be eight distractors. And now these targets are already been assigned to the subject that you have to look for one minute around, it will move with high speed. And you have to, at the end of the time, you have to say rightly, what are those four targets? That's the multi-object track. So in this period of time, what I did is that I just flashed, right, uh, randomly, uh, 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 this kind of rings outside a target as well as distractor every two seconds. So the notion is if the subject is actually attending to the target, so the attentional features on the target, that is the waves, right? Their amplitude, the sensory amplitude 
will be high than if that the, the ring actually features on the destructors. So that's why I these these things goes on randomly. So the trials have been taken, and so targets and the distractors they were allocated separately. And then I try to find out the way that when these time lock scene uh, near you just appeared, that whenever I am just flashing this light or the ring around, so from that start when the amplitude is changing. So if it is put on a target then I expect that if the subject is actually looking at the target, then there will be a particular correlate as the brain waves on the target and not on the distractor. This is how I try to differentiate. So a person who is a very good tracker of multiple objects or who is learning to actually process the information parallelly, they will be better in that job. They will show these electro, uh, this, this correlates. There are other ways also. We can use uh, uh, this kind of to study the eye movements, eye movements then where it is looking upon. And for subjective study, there is always a subjective study as the end because the target has to click by his own that which are the probable th targets that were been shown and that changed its position due to this random collision between itself and with the wall. Then he traces each time there will be a cross and there will be the correct validation. It will be shown for in this case, the subject has made three out of four correct. So this is how the things are done. Thank you so much, Dr. Dutta. We just completed uh, one, full, full, one full hour and you have been able to engage your attention. I don't think anybody suffered from concentration or attention deficit during your talk. Uh, so we are thankful to you. So tomorrow you have a very interesting talk by Professor Bindu M. Kuti. She is a professor in charge human sleep and cognition research laboratory. And she is in charge of the Center for Cognitive Sciences Consciousness Studies in the Department of Neurophysiology in Nimhans. National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore. They have recently started a Center for Consciousness Studies. And our university, Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational Research Institute, our university uh, has entered into an MOU with uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, center. Uh, tomorrow she'll be talking about it. Thank you.